This is the 2024 Crown, Toyota's all-new premium sedan that replaced the Avalon just last year. But can this crossover-inspired sedan actually do crossover things? We're going to check out all the features, take it for a drive, and then test its off-road capabilities. That's coming up right now on Driving Sports TV. Crown is a new brand here in North America, but in Japan, Crown is celebrating its 16th generation. More than just a name, presidents, kings, and emperors have all been shuttled in vehicles that carry the Crown nameplate. Today we're going to get into the details of this North American 2024 Toyota Crown Platinum. We'll check out all the features, take it for a drive, and then see how well it does against the easy course at our Peninsula Proving Grounds. The car we have here for testing is a Platinum with premium two-tone paint, mud guards, and a preferred accessory package that includes mud mats. Prices you see it here, $55,052, and including destination. This top trim does include the Hybrid Max powertrain with all-wheel drive. Tires here are Bridgestone Taranzas, and you will note that, yeah, these are 21-inch wheels. They are massive. Actual size is a 225-45R21 fitment. It might be premium, but it still has a prop rod. It features a 2.4-liter turbocharged four-cylinder along with a trio of electric motors for a total system output of 340 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. The transmission is a new six-speed automatic with a hydraulic wet plate start clutch for direct power. EPA rates economy at 29 miles to the gallon in the city and 32 on the highway. Not bad when you consider just how much power this vehicle packs. Though all-wheel drive is standard across all Crown trims, this Platinum gets the best full-time system. It uses a more powerful electric motor in the rear, so it can shift power from 70-30 all the way to 20-80, making this a rear bias performance sedan. It is important to note that lower trims only get a part-time all-wheel drive system. The Platinum here also gets adaptive variable suspension. This not only responds to road conditions, it also is adjusted based on various drive modes. Because this is a sedan, you only get 15.2 cubic feet in the back. The second row does fold down for larger objects. Under the floor is a partial spare. Even though this does look like a crossover, it only has 5.8 inches of ground clearance, which is the same as a Camry. So looks are deceptive. That being said, the seating position is actually four inches higher than a Camry, which makes ingress egress a lot easier. Now let's check out the inside. Okay, here in the second row, I have lots of leg room. I get vents, I get USB-C sockets. I even get fold down armrests with integrated cup holders. But what I don't have back here is a lot of headroom. There's a little cutout here. As long as I keep my head back here, it's okay. But getting in and out, constantly hitting myself here. Uh, I do get seat warmers, but they are single stage only. But I think considering this is a sedan, this really isn't too bad. You need more room, you're gonna have to move up to something bigger and more expensive. Here we are back inside the Toyota Crown. And I have to say, this is a very comfortable interior. The seats feel great. They are wrapped in leather. They're ventilated and heated. I get lots of power adjustments down here, including lumbar control, which is nice. The steering wheel wrapped in leather. Um, I get paddle shifters, integrated adaptive cruise control, as well as stereo controls. And this has a digital gauge cluster, which means I can customize it to my whims. Not only are there a number of designs, but I can also specify what I want inside the middle of each gauge, which is great. Love the customization aspects of this system. 
Over here, we have an infotainment system that is running the latest Toyota Lexus system. It is the same system in both sets of vehicles these days. And this is very modern. It has mapping built in, plus it supports wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And I really like this charging pad. I basically just insert my phone there. Now this is a 15 Pro Max, so this is the biggest of the iPhones and it fits with a little bit of extra space. Also, even with a thick case on, it charges. That's great. <laughs> now for Aircon, they do give me physical switch gear, which I like. Um, I get little toggles that I can push up for more temperature, push down for less. Very clear, easy to use. Uh, below that, I get the little shifter. It's not my favorite shifting mechanism, but it does the job. Uh, I also get multiple drive modes, and because this has adaptive suspension that is adjustable, um, the drive mode does affect the suspension setup. So you affect power, all-wheel drive, and drive feel, which is awesome. Lots of drive modes here, everything from Eco, Comfort, Normal, Sport S, Sport S Plus, and I even get a custom setting. So if you're looking for drive modes, this vehicle definitely delivers. Uh, now we do get a massive panorama sunroof here, which I can open with a push of a button. I'm gonna close it right now though, because it's so bright out. This is an unusually sunny day here in the Pacific Northwest in winter time. Uh, and I will take it, thank you very much. Now, once I get my seating position all settled, I can set it in one of two stages of memory. Oh, and the steering wheel does both telescope and go up and down. Though because this is not a Lexus, it is a physical lever to set it. There is also a heated steering wheel here, which is cool. I have a couple stages of heat. So this being the top trim crown, it has, of course, all the active safety stuff you would expect. We get collision mitigation, we get blind spot warning, we get rear cross traffic alerts. Put the camera in reverse here. We see you have a surround view camera system, which is awesome. Put it into park. And then we also get adaptive cruise control with the stop and go support. Now that is stop and go is the one feature that they still charge extra for. Obviously you can get um, just standard adaptive cruise control on pretty much every Toyota made. Actually, I think it's available now on every Toyota made. Um, if not, it's most of them. Uh, here it is enhanced for stop and go traffic, which is cool. The transmission here is of course an automatic. It is a six speed and I do get paddle shifters if I want to control it all by myself. So what are we going to do today? Well, first we're gonna take this for a drive. Um, it's been a little bit more than a year since I last drove a Crown and the last time I drove it was at the press launch. And so today we're gonna to drive it on our local roads, see how it handles, see how this power distribution works. And then we're gonna see if we can actually do any crossover -y things like on dirt trails with a vehicle that has 5.8 inches of ground clearance. I know it's not a lot, but we'll see what we can do. Cool. So let's stop talking. Let's start driving. So here I am yet again behind the wheel of the all new Toyota Crown. Now the Crown is interesting because it is a crossover, but it's also a sedan. That is rarefied company. There's just, I mean, I can't even really think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, what was it? Subaru had their SUS <laughs> like 10 years ago. Yeah, it's just not a category where you're like, oh yeah, we need more of those. But on the other hand, it is interesting to see Toyota take this, the crown brand of all things, the pinnacle of Toyota luxury outside of Lexus, and to turn it into this. Now we did get a chance to look at this vehicle prior to its public announcement. Toyota took all our phones, put a bunch of journalists in a room and said, what do you think? And admittedly, yeah, a lot of us were, were kind of puzzled what we were looking at. I mean, we knew it was the upcoming crown, but uh, the shape was really befuddling. So is this car any good or is it just a gimmick? I mean, crossover sedan, what the heck? <laughs> So it is and it isn't. Let me explain. Up until last year, the Toyota Avalon was the pinnacle of Toyota sedans that you could buy in the US. Anything fancier, it was likely going to have a Lexus badge on it. So the Avalon was pretty nice, but it didn't sell very well. I mean, it was, it was dwindling figures. It was a fairly expensive vehicle, really nice though. But of course, it was also in the sedan category, which just really wasn't selling as well as crossovers. Everybody's moving to crossovers and SUVs. And you know, that gets to the other point. 
Why? It's because crossovers and SUVs are just massively practical. Not only do you get that extra ground clearance and that, you know, in some cases, pseudo rugged good looks, you also get a trunk that actually has room for stuff. Well, this is a larger sedan, so it does have room for stuff, although it is a traditional gate. It does, it's, it's not a coupe style gate where the glass goes up with the tailgate. Uh, so you can't get that whole like truck-like appliance that you can get with things that have a bigger hatch. But for a sedan, you know, the trunk space is actually pretty good. But where this particular vehicle I think is really confusing is the fact that it doesn't have any more ground clearance than a Camry. 5.8 inches. That's not a lot. So that then begs the question, why did they even bother making it kind of look like a crossover? So today I'm out here driving on my home turf. I'm out on the Washington State Peninsula, and this is, you know, pretty much our typical highway. And I have to say, cruising in this vehicle is very, very comfortable. It has adaptive suspension that are adjustable. Um, I can change it from a number of different settings, everything from comfort all the way up to sport plus. And they do actually matter. They make significant changes to the way that the powertrain works, the all wheel drive system works, and the suspension is set up. And you know, you put it in comfort and you're, you're riding pretty smooth here. Um, I have had this vehicle over Christmas break and I have already driven hundreds of miles with it at the time of filming. And I have to say, I really like this vehicle. I mean, everything from the way the tech is to the air con, but also more important to the way that the suspension and the all wheel drive system are set up. It's just a really comfortable car when you want it to be, but it can also get aggressive when you want it to be. And that is thanks to the really just spectacular powertrain this vehicle comes with. It has a four cylinder turbocharged gas engine up front that is combined with a number of electric motors that produces up to 400 pound feet of torque. Yeah. <laughs> this setup is very similar to what we're going to be seeing in the upcoming Land Cruiser. So that's kind of cool. Now in terms of MPGs, you're not going to get 400 pound feet of torque uh, for free you're gonna be paying with economy. And uh, like I said, I've been driving this vehicle all over the place uh, for the last few days. I've driven up to the family, I've driven to cousins, I've driven pretty much everywhere. And my average for all of that driving is about 26.7 miles to the gallon according to the vehicle. And I think that's actually pretty good considering the level of performance you get out of this machine. So let's go ahead and move it out of comfort, drive mode, and switch it over to Sport S. Hit the throttle, whoa! Now even though I know this episode started out, it was sunny and dry, typical Northwest weather, it is now very moist because some rain clouds move through. In fact, uh, we still have some fog hanging around, you know? Weather out here is just crazy. But even in these kind of slickish roads, I feel I'm in total control thanks to the all-wheel drive system in this vehicle. And not only is it just all-wheel drive to say it's all-wheel drive, this is like legit because this thing can push up to 80% of torque to the rear wheels. And it does it with a dedicated electric motor in the back, a bigger one than what you would see in something like the RAV4. It is a performance-oriented setup and I think it's just brilliant. Let's actually bump it up one more level to Sport S Plus. Suspension tightens up, throttle gets very, <laughs> uh, very quick, and woo! <laughs> okay, well let's try a zero to 60, so I'm gonna stop here. Let's just see what this thrust feels like. Uh, I'm in Sport Plus. I'm just gonna mosh the throttle and see what we got. Three, two, one, go. And woo! We got some wheel spin. Nice, that is so quick. Uh, way better performance than you would expect from just any old sedan. And even though this is a larger sedan, it doesn't feel big from the driver's seat. Um, I can kind of sense where my corners are, even going over this really tight bridge. Um, I'm not concerned about grinding at all. <laughs> yeah, throttle in, woo. Okay, yeah, this is fun. 
So inside here, we have a really nice digital gauge cluster. I like how you can configure it to your own uh, setup. There's four different menu designs, all of which look pretty different. And then of course you can customize everything even further. The new infotainment that Lexus and Toyota have been putting on all their vehicles, very good. I find it very reliable. The connection to wireless CarPlay is excellent uh, and it just works great. I usually have CarPlay up uh, and I have access to everything I need. And also uh, this charging pad. So the case I use is the quad lock case uh, because I can put it on bikes and stuff. But the thing about quad lock is that that's actually a pretty thick case. I don't know if you can tell it there how deep it is. So some chargers have problems. Some of the inductive chargers can't get through this, even though it's supposed to work. It's, I find it not as reliable as I would like, and that's on quad lock. But this inductive charger down here is powerful enough that I don't have issues with it. It charges all the time when I put the device in. And that's really good because some of Toyota's uh, inductive chargers are a little on the weak side uh, and you have to position it just right and then you hope that it charges. Yeah, I haven't had that issue at all with this setup. And I also like how my phone is secure in this slot. That's really nice. Now in terms of safety, we don't get a heads-up display, but I'm actually okay with that. I'm not a huge fan of heads-ups. Now pretty much all the Toyotas you buy today come with adaptive cruise control standard. This one has the more advanced stop and go feature so you can use it in rush hour. However, today, day after Christmas, no rush hour to be found. Oh well, so we're just gonna drive it normal. Uh, one thing I do like here though is that if I, I can pick between regular cruise control and adaptive cruise control. That way, if there's any like garbage on the on the sensors, like sometimes in snow, your radar sensor gets a little covered up and it doesn't work. Well, you can just pick regular cruise control if you like. So with adaptive cruise on, I set my pace and it will now not only match the vehicle speed in front of me if the vehicle in front of me is going slower than my target. Uh, it'll also auto steer and keep me centered in the lanes. Now this is of course a windy country road so that's not what this is designed for uh, but I have used it a lot and I find this system to be very good. No complaints. The transmission here is a six-speed automatic, a traditional automatic but it has a lockout in one so that it actually has a very direct shift feel. Uh, and that is really good when you're doing things like launching or getting started quickly. Uh, so it kind of almost feels like a manual off one, which is kind of nice. And then if you want to, you know, treat it more like a manual, you can always paddle shift right here and it'll very switchly change gears. Is it a DCT? No, of course not. But for this type of vehicle's target market, I think it's great. It gives you that option to kind of row your own gears, but it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not as clunky as a DCT. So, you know, that's good. Even though I am driving today the sedan version of the Crown, which is the first one that was launched, uh, I did recently see the new Crown Signia, which is a wagon version of this vehicle, and I think it looks amazing. This one was basically just a warning across the bow of all of the car makers uh, that Crown was coming. But the Signia, I think, is the one that's really going to start eating up market share, specifically from Volvo and its premium wagon segment, and even maybe a little bit from Subaru. You know, people who want a fun-to-drive wagon, but maybe want something a little bit more premium, the Crown Signia might be what they were looking for. So looking forward to that. Obviously I'll have a full test drive once we can actually get behind the wheel of one. Okay, system is now warning me that I'm entering a school zone. Hello school, no school in session today so we don't really have to slow down. Uh, but of course the warning systems do work. Okay, we'll go ahead and switch this back into normal. Now there is no EV mode, even though this is a hybrid, the battery is just not really big enough. Uh, the hybrid battery system is really designed for uh, the stop and go, recharge, that, that quick boost from zero, and of course powering the rear motor for all wheel drive. Now, one question I always get is what happens if you run out of battery? Well, you really don't because it's powering a generator that is constantly powering the battery. So even if you're going up a very, very long steep hill, uh, it is still generating power for that battery. Uh, and also it will always be on because this is full time 
all-wheel drive, not part-time all-wheel drive like you get in some other vehicles. Even the RAV4 would be considered part-time all-wheel drive because that rear electric motor doesn't always kick in. However, on this vehicle, you always have some power to those rear wheels. Now, that's not on all Crown trims. That is specific to the Platinum, which has the highest and version of the all-wheel drive system and the highest output from the motor. So, so now we're gonna see if this crossover-shaped sedan can do crossover things. We're gonna take it onto the easy course at our Peninsula Proving Grounds. Uh, wasn't designed for the ground clearance of a Camry, but uh, we're gonna see if this thing can get through it. And that will also answer the question, can you drive a Camry through our off-road course? Uh, I'm guessing the answer is no but I'm willing to find out for sure. I really like this car, so comfortable. Before we hit the trail, let's try a slip test and see just how power is distributed around this all wheel drive system. Line it up. So I'm on a loose gravel surface, and the idea here is that uh, because we won't have much traction that you'll be able to really see as we slow it down with the slow motion cameras, how power is distributed front and back. Now this is supposed to be a rear bias system, so you should see a lot of wheels spin in the rear wheels. And I am gonna go ahead and turn off traction control so we get maximum spin. Okay, drive mode sport plus to start, traction control disabled. Uh, I'm basically just gonna mosh the throttle because we have electric as start assist. Uh, I'm not gonna preload the turbo because I just don't need to. Three, two, one, and go. Woo! Oh, wow, that hits hard. Let's see what the other drive modes look like now. It did take a moment for the traction control to really fully release. Uh, that's pretty common on vehicles like this. Let's see, drive. Let's take it out of Sport Plus and we'll just go to normal and see how that affects things. Three, two, one, go. Whoa, man, that, when that power kicks, it hits hard. Wow. Looking at the slow motion, I am really surprised at how much torque goes to the front wheels. Now you can see the rear wheel trying to move right at the start, but basically when it starts to slip, it puts a lot of that power to the front wheels. So that's a lot of logic just kicking on in. If you compare this versus the CX-90 that we tested recently, the PHEV, you can see that because that is mechanically a rear wheel drive base system, it puts a lot more power to that rear wheel just by default, even in slippery conditions. On the side slip test, there wasn't a lot of action from the rear wheels. So my question is, in a rally slide style condition, will it push power back there and help rotate the back? Let's find out. Uh, I have traction control off. I'm in Sport S Plus. I'm just gonna add throttle as I come around this corner. Oh, that traction control just doesn't wanna give up. Doesn't matter what I do. I can feel power going to the back, but it really wants to kind of bring power to the front because it detects it's slipping. So power theoretically goes to the back, but it just doesn't really give you that rear wheel drive performance that you get in something that is physically a rear wheel drive vehicle with all of the gas and electric stuff going to the back. In this case, just the electric alone isn't enough. Okay, well, with that established, let's try uh, our easy course, which is designed for SUVs, not for sedans. But you know what? Eh, let's give it a try. Uh, and if I detect that I'm going to crunch something, then I'll just back out. Yeah, hopefully it's sooner than later. <laughs> because later, I don't want to have to back out of this whole thing. Uh, anyway, for this, I am going to set the drive mode to normal, because why not? Put it in drive. Away we go. This climb here, I'm a little concerned about clearance, of course. Uh, so I'm going to go a little wide. I think that might help. Now these are obviously street tires. They are not designed for this kind of stuff. So a little momentum might be necessary in spots. Yeah, like there. Let's just go back. Add a little momentum. 
<laughs> Let's try that again. And away we go. Oh. Huh. Okay, well. For those who say I can get a Camry into this off-road course, uh, here's item number one. Really good all-wheel drive system. And uh, I can't even get up the first climb. Oh, okay, or can I? Oh, I did. <laughs> I just had to rock it a lot. <laughs> okay. Let me check clearances, make sure I'm not rubbing on anything because this thing is so low. Oof. That is, uh, that is very close. And we've also shifted a lot this direction simply because of the tires on the mud. So let's uh, realign and then continue on. Let's keep traction control on. Let's see if we get through this and I gotta hold, stay to the right because I don't have enough ground clearance to go all the way into the ditch on the left. <laughs> so much rubbing, so much rubbing. Oh. Now we got a tilt. So I'm going to get out and check this because I don't want to rip this front bumper off. I know you hear it a lot from me, but this has 5.8 inches of ground clearance. This is a different case right here altogether. Okay, I think we're, we're doing okay so far here. Nothing's looking like it's going to rip off. Oh man, that is so close. <laughs> right, so... This car has a couple issues with it. First off, no ground clearance, but the second issue is long wheelbase. So straddling these is kind of challenging. Let's see what this does. Let's go straight. Will it shift power around? I'm just keeping throttle on. Ooh. We're kind of sliding. There is a tree right in front of me. Whoa, yeah, that's not the right way. Oh, don't want to hit that tree. Mm, backing up, it works. Let's cut it right. Oh, can we get through it? <laughs> we did. We got through it. Oh my, that was uh, that was dicey. Will anybody ever do this with a crown? Probably not. But if you need to, you know it can do it. <laughs> now for the final exit. Let's go ahead and turn on the camera here. Uh, for the final exit, we're going to have to go over a big bump. Uh, hopefully we don't punch it. Oh, we can slightly make it over. Okay. Are we high centering? We're high centering. Hey, the whole vehicle's high centered now. Come on. Up. Uh, that's a problem. Okay, well, I've high centered the vehicle on the exit, so uh, time to grab some rocks. Yay. Okay, so clearly this vehicle is not meant for trail use. There's not even a trail mode, but I thought it would be kind of fun to just see how well it would do. It was a test both for this vehicle as well for our trail. Can we bring something less than sufficient through it? And the answer is kind of a little yes, kind of a little no. Obviously we needed an assist at the end. It was not gonna get over that exit, uh, which is good because that exit is about the same height as the logs, uh, which is the next stage on this trail. And we're clearly not gonna do that with this vehicle. Uh, so overall, I love driving this vehicle just every day. In terms of as a performance driver, it is fun to drive, but it doesn't have the same kind of feel that you get from something like, you know, a BMW, a vehicle that is natively a rear wheel drive vehicle. This one, it still kind of wants to be front wheel drive in all the conditions in which I would like it to be more rear wheel drive. So technically, yes, it can do a lot of power to the back, uh, but in reality, you can't like flick the car sideways using a power oversteer maneuver. It just won't let you do it because it detects slip. And when it does that, it pushes power to the front. There's just nothing you can do because of the stability control systems. Uh, but you know, 
in spite of that, for a totally normal daily driver, this car is excellent. To talk about a cruising machine, it is comfortable. It's capable, it has all the tech that I would want in this year, and I, I really like it. <laughs> for Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. Thanks for watching, and thanks for coming along on this kind of wacky adventure doing the off-road course. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, share videos. We make them for you. I hope you enjoy them. And also our Peninsula Proving Grounds, we're just getting started with this place. We got more trails to put in. Uh, we got more tests to uh, add. So it's going to be exciting and 2024 is going to be amazing. So have a great new year. We'll see you right here in 2024. Or if you're watching this in 2025, thanks for doing that too.